warm welcome back. Uh, now we will start with the next topic, talking about integration. And even though we don't read and talk as much as we, as we did a couple of years ago about integration, even if we don't read about conflict, refugee crisis, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Actually, today, 65 million people are forced from their home. That is the highest number since World War II. 22 million people are refugees, and 50% of them are under the age of 18. Every day, 28,300 people are forced from their home. So, even if we don't read about it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But no person should be referred to as a number or volumes. Because behind each of these numbers, there's someone's daughter, or son, mother or father, or a friend. And when I was traveling with the UN Foundation Global Entrepreneurship Council to Jordan to visit the largest refugee camps for Syrian refugees called Satari Camp, I met with Mohammed, a Syrian engineer a father of four. And outside his like, home metal container where they lived, he had built the most beautiful, and it was huge, gigantic, artwork of stones collected from the camp. And I asked him, how come? And he was just looking at me and said, you know, Anna, I would love to, I would like to, that my children, when they come home from the temporary school, that they can see some beauty. And then I realized that this artwork, this construction, was a construction of hope, love, and dignity. That is the importance, not only about music, but the importance of art. And moving from Jordan to Sweden, it feels like something is broken. So we are doing quite well in Sweden, we do top nearly every ranking, and still, we are more nationalistic than ever. There are fewer people than ever that are positive to refugees. And unfortunately, the picture is the same in most European countries. The world has changed, and leaders, politicians, decision makers are talking about refugees as number, about the costs, instead of really talking about integration and how we can find new ideas to defend our open society. And yes, my friends, Integration can be complicated. It can be challenging, but it will always be worth fighting for. Because integration is about meeting each other. It is about curiosity. It's about creativity. And it's about humanity. And it's simple, it's about you and me. 
And Lisa, when we talked about the different topic of today, you also agreed that this is really one of the most important topic right now to really lift on this stage. Why did you think it was so important? Well, I think that I'm a bit scared that we are creating parallel universes <laughs> that are moving people away from each other. And with that comes fear and inequality, really bad <laughs> decisions, and not at all that curiosity. Mm. And I think that we should use every stage <laughs> that we could ever use to make sure that we are not fostering that culture. But second of all, I also think it's about innovation and problem solving. You know, innovation does come from friction. <laughs> innovation does come from, you know, different perspectives, being different, having, you know, all the broader spectrums in the world. So I just think it's such waste <laughs> that we are not playing together, that we have this us and them kind of cultures. Because I actually do believe that to create all those solutions that we desperately need, integration or inclusiveness is key for that. And, and just listening again to, to Changer Studio and Changer Sub, I think it's a brilliant example of acting, not Absolutely. just talking about the numbers, but doing things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and showing that, you know, that power of connecting people. And it is as simple as me meeting you once and making sure that you are on every stage that I could possibly invite you to. <laughs> That's how easy it is, right? We need to use ourselves, our networks, whatever we have, to create those connections. It's and that's quite easy. It's quite easy. It's actually quite easy. And it's all about people. Hmm. It's all about our relationships. So with that, uh, I kind of see them over there. I'd like to introduce to you the artist and entrepreneur Quincy Jones III and his collaborator, Anik, mm. uh, and they have dedicated their lives to help people who kind of ended up in the wrong path. Give and them they, a warm. Give, yeah, give yeah. them a warm yeah. applause. They are coming here. Yes, so I will. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> hey. Get it on it. Yes, yep. yes. I want this one. I have to give up my favorite toy. No, no. <laughs> I invited you here, but I'll take this one. OK. OK, so I mean, we have a lot to talk about. Yep. Can uh, I just say something real quick? Yes, I just yes, want to yes, thank yes. you for doing what you do, because I think we need a lot more of this. And it's a beautiful thing. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, give her a round of applause. Thank you. So um, we invited you here because both of you are doing super interesting things. And um, the thing that we're going to concentrate on today is called third. Can yes. we just start with the name? Why? OK, so the name really stands for third culture, which is what we call our culture. And the reason for that is because, like, say you're a Somali who lives in Sweden, who grew up in Sweden, when you go to Somalia, they don't consider you a native there. They consider you more Swedish. And then when you come here, you're considered an outsider. Yeah. And so these communities had to create a third culture that they could embrace in order to have an identity. And usually that th third culture is hip hop. Mm -hmm. So African Americans went through the same thing. You know, they couldn't connect with Africa. They couldn't connect with America. So they created hip hop. That was their own culture. So that's what that stands for. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm Quincy Jones III also. So that's <laughs> a little. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> clever name. Yep. You have engaged a lot in helping what we in Sweden call Orten. Yeah. Um, how come? Because I think a lot of people wonder what the connection is, but when I was four years old, I moved from Beverly Hills, from a pretty posh life with celebrities all over the place, Jack Nicholson in our swimming pool and stuff like that, to um, in Stockholm, you know, the further out you live, if you're on the last station, it's usually the most immigrants and the most problems. Mm. And so we moved to the last station on the south side. Which one is that? Uh, Farsta Strand mm. at the time, and then also Yudbru. So, so I went from this to that, and then back to this, and back and forth my whole life. And when I was a kid, it was kind of like a bipolar experience. But what I found later in life is that my calling is to build the bridge. 
Yeah. You know? So I understand both sides equally. And you can speak all languages. I guess, well, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> Those cult two languages. cultural languages. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And what were the problems regarding Im immigration when, and immigrants when you grow up, like over here? Yeah, so um, that's me up there on the left, and you can read. Do, is everybody here Swedish? Or? Not everyone here is Swedish. You have to so translate. So it says here they're um, uh, arresting the king of Kung San, which is a park right outside of here, which is where thousands of immigrant kids, a lot of them were delinquent criminal kids, um, would hang out. And all that culminated in a big riot in Kung San. And so that's, that's what they're you. talking about, that they arrested him, and we were sort of a part of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think the reason for us going into that life was because we felt excluded, you know? Mm. And so when the system didn't include us, we went against it, you know? And we were attacked sometimes by skinheads, so we just st started doing it back, right? And so um, while we were standing in that park, up to no good probably, <laughs> Um, this man right here, Stefan Hildebrand, who's a big Swedish director, he's like the Oliver Stone of Sweden, he came up to me and Paolo, who was known as the king of the park, right, the worst guy, and he said, you guys have leadership qualities, and I believe in you, and I want you to be in my film, and I want you to play yourself and tell your own story about the park. And so we did that, and he told Paolo, you have the lead, he told me I have the second lead, and I could do the soundtrack, and I had never made a record before, but I told him I could. Of course. <laughs> and so he gave us the opportunity, which was beautiful. And so, long story short, the movie was a big hit, it was one of the most watched um, movies in Sweden, and all the kids up in Kiruna. The name is here, Stockholm's Not. Stockholm's Not, yep. Yeah, you've seen it, right? Yeah. And uh, the soundtrack was also a hit, and that gave us, you know, everybody was telling us at that time that you were going to fail because we were getting in trouble and stuff. And he told us, I believe in you. And that little word changed our whole psyche. Mm. And so we went on to do big things. And it was probably because of that opportunity, you know. So I think that's what I want to do now for other people. You yeah, know? I believe in you. Yeah. And we've seen... A week after that movie came out, yep. and it was a big hit, uh, you moved to the States. Yep. Uh, why? Um, well, our record did good, and I got a little hubris. <laughs> so I figured, you know, let's go take over America, too, you know? I had one record out, you know? And so I moved to uh, Harlem, the South Bronx and South Central, which are like the worst ghettos in America, but that's where hip-hop was at at the time. So I wanted to prove to them that Sweden could do it, you know? And so um, I moved to Harlem first. I was 16 years old, all by myself, and just would walk around these different neighborhoods and find talent just for the passion. I just wanted to prove there was no money in hip hop yet. So I just wanted to show them that we can do it and to kind of bond with the rappers and work with them before the fad ended, which is what they were saying. You yeah. know? And so I would just walk around the neighborhood and meet all these guys. So you can see like some of the people I met before they were even famous. Like, Nipsey Hussle, Easy e Tupac, LL Cool J. We're 15 in that picture, you know? So just my passion led me to the best artist, you know? Mm. And, and I started developing sort of a skill for finding talent early. But how do you, like, how did you sense that that talent would then later become icons? Uh, just love, you know? I love the culture. I didn't, there was no money in hip hop when we started. Mm. And then, thank the Lord, this happened. So this is the work that resulted from, you know. So it's the same thing with Stokos Now. We, we didn't really know what we were doing, but we had a passion for it, and we had a lot of drive, and, and, and it led to good things, you know. And so most of the people that we work with weren't just successful, but they were long-term icons, you know. So I think uh, we started developing a sense of, what it looks like in yeah. the early stages. And was your motivation to sell records and make money, or what was it? No, we were just trying to be the best. That was it. I think that's, there, like I said, the money in, in the big record sales came a l later. When we were putting it together, it was just us finding people that we liked. It sounds know? so easy, I have to say. I just found people, and then all of them became icons. It's easy. I think love <laughs> leads you the right path, right? Yeah. If you love something, I think you, you try harder without even thinking about it. Yeah. You know? So I never thought, like, a, like, it wasn't a competition for me. It was more about, like, just doing my best to prove that I should be a part of this culture, you know? 
And then at some point you decided to start documenting this culture by filming artists. Yeah, Why? So, so Tupac passed away and, um, and he was like, we were our favorite collaborators, you know, we were like a team. Mm. And when he passed away, um, uh, I saw all the, the media coverage of him and I was like, that's not my friend at all. It was like very two dimensional. They made him out to be like a gangster and only, and he was engaged to my sister. And I saw the love letters that he wrote and he was like a soft, nice, spiritual person that could talk to any group of people in the world. Yeah. He wanted to change the world and help people and they'd never talked about that. So I started filming people myself so that I can humanize hip hop to the rest of the world and tell the stories more accurately, you know? So um, we, the same, theory I would use with the music is I would just walk around the neighborhood and try to find uh, the best talent that hadn't made it yet and believe in them early and film them so that we can catch their whole rise. And uh, that ratio is also pretty, pretty incredible. Wow. I have a clip yeah. that I can show you can guys. We can we see the clip? So these are all people that we just invested in by filming them, you know. Oops. Oops. The, the former one. A lot of what Tupac was doing musically, he was doing with, you, with Q. And he was doing with Q separately and at his home because he had a plan. He had a company that he was starting. He wanted to start his, his music there. He had a whole operational. Now, a lot of people are very angry with me because I can't do what Tupac planned to do. I can't. All I can do is to tell you that you should know that what he was doing <laughs> he was doing with, um, with QD3. When people used to ask me last year, what you call your music, like hardcore, I didn't even put it in that position. I said it was soul music, because that's what it is to me. It's like Bill Withers and Marvin Gaye, you know how they used to like sing? That shit like, you know, get you through. Just like as if you got a phone call from a homie to say, yeah, I understand, you know what I'm saying? It's like the music lets you know that another person understands. And for, for, for the black community especially, we have like broken families with no father, no big brothers, and so the, the music becomes the big brother, and or, or the music becomes the father. See, the chronic is just like a big commercial for the new record label, you know, Death Row. You right. know what I'm saying? Um, tell me how we came up with the name. Basically, it was like. It was a part of my life. The Chronic was a part of my life, and I had brought it in the, you know what I'm saying, to Dre life with the influence, you know what I'm saying? Those out there who know what the Chronic is, they know what I'm spitting at. Put the pickups back in now. Yeah. Except on the first one. Up, you turn me on. <laughs> I don't trust nobody. Only person I feel obligated to answer to is Eminem and Dr. Trey. You understand what I'm saying to you? Like, if they call for something, I'm gonna jump and go do it. You feel me? Because that boy made a decision in his head, yo, I'm gonna go, yo, I like this guy. Yo, Dre, you wanna? And that decision right there changed my whole life. You know, I don't think he realizes that it changed my whole life. I think he just, he just thinks it's music. You see that? video for more than 30 seconds. <laughs> you know, another thing, I think I have stigma of being arrogant because I say something like, yo, I'm gonna sell 10 million, right? And then I feel like those are people that just have low self-esteem and they wanna try to push that onto you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't feel like I can do it. I don't feel like you could do it. And I ask him a question like that, like, you think Lauryn Hill can sell 10 million? And they say, yeah, of course Lauryn Hill can sell 10 million. I'm like, well, you fucking doubting me then. You're saying, you're basically telling me you're no Lauryn Hill. Because the thing is, to the point where it's proven, I gotta tell you because nobody believes it. And I'm just telling y'all just so I can floss later. I'm just telling y'all, I'm just running down the court talking shit right now. Like this, like, yo, watch what I'm about to do when I get down here. I work for this. I know that when I get the opportunity, I'm gonna be able to jump for that motherfucking three-point line and do a 360 dunk. They can't imagine how much I've worked for this point. So anybody that I'm meeting for the first time, an interview coming to me like, yeah, I heard you was arrogant. 
You don't know what I've been through. And you don't know what I'm about to do. And you don't know the motivation that's inside of me. So you can't tell me what, I, what I'm going to end up being. So if y'all take that as the arrogance, hey, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. He Boom. was right. He was right. So, um, yeah. <laughs> what did you do with all this footage? So, um, we put together a company called QD3 Entertainment and, um, and just started making documentaries. And because it was the first time that the urban community around the whole world had seen their stories done from the inside and this authentic, they just sold on their own and it was very successful. So uh, we were really the ones who brought um, like authentic hip hop media to mainstream TV, you know? Yeah. And so there was a, uh, nobody wanted to buy the projects when we pitched it because they didn't understand the value of it. So we produced it ourselves and then we came back to them. And once they saw all the sales in the store, they were selling more than some feature films. Um, then they, they licensed the, the titles and we were able to own it. So we own every film. We made 25 movies and, and um, sold millions of units and we were able to own everything. So um, it was a good thing, actually. <laughs> yeah. Again, <laughs> sounds so easy. So this success can happen here, too. And that's... That's, that's why you're here. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I remember we met at Brilliant Minds a couple of years ago, yep. and you were working on the Anderson Horowitz backed company. How, yes. how did you move into tech? So, um, he can tell you, anybody who knows me, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a tech geek first. So I got into music. For, before music? Yeah, because hmm. I wanted to do tech, but music was only, th they didn't have the internet back then. So I would have taken coding classes, but at the time, uh, it was music engineering was exciting because you could be creative and, and then do tech at the same time. So I liked the lights and the buttons, and that's what drove me to the studio. Oh. You know, so um, I've been going to tech conferences. I was like the only person of color and the only person from hip hop for 10 years at least at all these tech conferences. That's me talking at one way before even YouTube, right? <laughs> and so um, I read Ben Horowitz's book. He's like the godfather of VC investing, one of the best in the world. He's like the Steve Jobs of tech investments. And uh, I wrote him on Twitter and I said, I, I love your book. I'd like to meet you and tell you about this idea that I had. And I've been thinking about it for, for a long time because it solved a problem that we've all had in the creative community. And, um, and he said, yes, I took the meeting and he invested in our company and, and it kind of just went from there, you know. You now know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you recently moved back to Sweden. Yes. How come? I mean, isn't this fantastic? Yeah. I mean, I moved back because you know how we've sort of been in the right place at the right time because of the gut feeling yeah. and the love for something and you just have a feeling that something exciting is about to happen. To me, when I came back to do Idol and I, and I saw what's going on in Uten where you have 60 different nationalities in one place. I mean, that's the future of culture. Yep. And it's the future of urban culture for sure. So when you look at all these little circles, these are all areas that are inaccessible. Did you all hear this? This is the future of culture? Just yeah. so that you, you know, there's, heard what he said? Yeah. There's no place in the world where you can get all that culture in one place. So these kids are going to be the most culturally literate kids in the world. Third culture kids are the future of the world, period. <laughs> if, if you work for Ikea or H&M and you're hiring a, a chief marketing officer that needs to understand global, there's no school for it. That's the school, living in Uten, you know, and I know that personally. He, we're all, you know, from the same thing. So all these circles to us is market share, and all those circles is where, in my opinion, some of the best talent always lives. Yeah. And, and if you expand this map to Sweden and then to all of Europe, it looks the same all over the place, but those areas are unattended to right now. So our, I'm here basically to mine that talent and to, to create an infrastructure that can help them thrive, you know. And before you decided to come back, did you test your gut feeling or did you just come? Well, um, what we did in America was one test that shows that when you go to an underserved area that's been excluded and give them the mic, they take it and never give it back and they kill it, right? <laughs> Some of the most iconic artists. And I think the same is true here. 
So I wanted to do a test, so when I got asked to do uh, Idol in 2016, I asked them if I can go into Urten. So we went into the three main no-go zones, Angered, Tiensta, and Rosengård. And I did my own audition called the Quincy Tour, and we went, just did it right at the Ungdomsgård, Blua Huset, and had a little circle, and people would go in and show us what they had, and I would take some of those kids into the main show. And, and uh, at the end of the show, uh, one of those kids won the whole thing. <laughs> You okay. <laughs> and it was. It's, 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 it's kind of a proof to yeah, the. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and I heard um, that he won with 82% of the votes. And most of the people voting are like, you know, grandmas yeah, yeah, from Lake yeah, Sound and yeah. stuff like that. 82%. So, so I think when they get exposure, they win. You know, they have people like it, but there's just not enough exposure. So that's what we want to create. Yeah. So now you're building a, a new ecosystem yep. for the third culture. Exactly. Share a little bit about that. Yeah, so we, the opportunity that we see is to do exactly what we did in America. Now, urban culture is number one around the world on Spotify, mm. Facebook, everything. And on TV, it's one of the top genres also. And so we want to basically globalize the success we had in America and do the same for underserved immigrant communities yeah. everywhere. And so. The big problem here is that we don't have positive, positive media exposure. Most of the stuff you see on the news is negative and it blames us for things that we may not have even created in the first place. And so we're going to create a media platform that consists of a production company where third culture kids can tell their own stories their way authentically. And then um, a media platform like a third channel basically that's all focused on third culture so that there's a united voice public facing. Yeah. You know? Secondly, um, the second problem is that brands can't access these areas, so there's no way for them to gather data to market to or from these kids. And it's, it's like 30% of Sweden that they can't reach. And we're going to solve that problem by creating an agency where we hire people from the community and then build the bridge with brands. And both sides win because yeah. some of the best talent and the biggest influencers are in Uten, so we just put that bridge there and they can communicate. A bridge again. Exactly. Uh, third problem is that Live events, Kevin Hart performed to a uh, sold-out audience at Gluben. Two nights in a row, it was almost 95% immigrants in the room, but nobody's scaling that. So we're going to set up a live events company that, that scales that and, and provides them with comedy tours, you know, live events like South by Southwest and all that kind of stuff. It's super underserved. And then uh, the last problem is uh, Lack of access and monetization. If you live in Uten, you can be the best producer in the world, but if you can't connect with the right people in your no network, no one knows, exactly. You may not be able to make money from it. And so we built a platform where people from Uten, no matter where they live, they can connect with the right people, um, uh, like brands or yourself, um, so that they can create monetization opportunities amongst each other also. And so there's a payment gateway. So if somebody works at a brand agency and they're like, man, I need a great urban artist, they can just go on the platform, find them, and whatever work they do, they pay them on the platform so everybody can stay where they are. Yeah. And so that gives them the access. And this is the man that built the platform. And <laughs> to me, he's, he's like one of the most special types of people I know because he's equally creative and equally tech. And so he's a, he's a dancer, musician, everything. So I'll let him kind of explain his background and then. All right. So my name is Anik Devon. Um, I started off as a dancer. Uh, I danced actually before I could even walk. Wow. Uh, so that's, that's really how I fell in love with hip hop. Uh, and that got me into my older brother, who's right there, who, uh, who brought home coding for dummies books. Yeah. And I found this great relation between the robotic style of dance that I was doing with coding. So that itself just brought a new love to me. Yeah. Um, I just wish more kids yep. <laughs> saw that connection. You know, that's just an amazing thing. So, so then you learned how to code. Yeah, exactly. And one thing led to another. Um, and now we have the Ozone platform. So wow. that's, that's the new product. Good. Yes. Are you going to share that a little bit yes. with us? Yes. Um, just, just a little brief about the platform before, yep. before I go ahead and show it. Um, it's a, it's, it really serves the underserved communities and gives them premium access to success. Uh, and it does so through a platform. It's an app. Um, and you can sign up as a brand or as a creator. So yeah, we'll show the platform so you guys can see how it actually looks. 
So you can find like-minded people globally, you network with brands and industry executives, and you can monetize your art. Um, we're walking through the process of how it is when you sign up as a creative. So we put the creatives first. So you have a big profile photo of you. It's tagged with your skill sets. And uh, you showcase your location on the, on the profile as well. Uh, we have something called user uh, or something called profile value, which is a score that uh, indicates your experience value. You can authenticate your profile with Spotify, IMDb, and other similar services. And based on that, together with an algorithm, you, you get a score uh, that's based on your numbers and your social impact. So here's a profile. You upload creative work that shows up as projects on your profile. You have an about view where you can read more about the profile, the skills that they have, who they work with, and what collectives they're part of. Collectives are groups of teams. So it can be as small as a producer and a singer duo who pushes out projects together, like singles, mixtapes, and merch. Or it could be as big as um, a global team. Um, and in that sense, it could be led by a big artist such as Snoop Dogg. So if Snoop would, would have a collective, he would probably bring on graphic artists or designers from all across the globe to help him bring uh, or build per, uh, products or merchandise mm. for his brand. Then on the feed, you as a brand, you can upload collaborative projects. And collaborative projects invites other users to take part and submit their ideas to the brands. So you fill in all the details and ideas and a, sort of like a vision board that you have for a specific idea. Uh, in this case, it's Red Bull looking for graffiti artists for an event. So when you upload this vision board, you, um, you set your price, you link any references that you have, and then you sit back and wait for it to be reviewed. Wow. And Make then money. moving on, um, the feed really serves to you as a creative. So if you want to have or, or look for some people in Tiensta or projects in Tiensta, you can search for that. You can also filter and find specific skills in Tiensta, and you will see a feed with people just with those skills in that, uh, in that area. And when you do find someone that you feel that you're connected with, you can directly have a transaction with them on the platform. You can validate their profile. You can see who vouched for their skills, uh, what collectives they're par part of, and who they have been working with before. Wow. For the creators in the room, do you want this? Yeah? yeah. OK. Thanks. And for the brands, I'm not even going to ask you. You desperately need this because yeah. you're losing out on 30% we just heard. Yep. <laughs> so, okay, if you're not impressed so far, I just also have to say and talk about that you're not only doing innovative stuff when it comes to business. In the US, you also were really doing some groundwork and you know, did some work with gangs. And yep. now, how is that coming back here? I mean, I was once an at-risk kid myself, can... you know, I got in trouble a lot when I was young because, you know, we didn't have that mentor around. And um, so my whole life, I've seen a lot of my most talented friends, to be honest, the most talented ones, the ones that had more talent than us, fall by the wayside because they were too ambitious or they didn't have the right path, yeah. so they slipped. And so I'm really concerned about not letting that happen again and again and again. And so um, in LA, um, a lot of people in hip hop work with, with gang members and, and transform them to, to make them useful in society. And they now have a position in our industry that's very helpful and they're walked completely away from it. So because of that, um, there used to be about 1,400 gang murders just in LA alone yeah. uh, when I was living there in the middle of it. And now there's maybe 125, right? And so there's a drastic and, and difference. Are you claiming Music being a big part music of that. Music was a big part of it wow. because it gave people something to aim at and, and you know, it gave them visible examples of success. Yeah. And in the music industry, you, know, you don't have to go to Harvard to work in hip hop. You have to know what's going on. And so these kids know what's going on. So as soon as they got that opportunity, that was it. Yeah. You know, it was not even, they didn't have to think twice about it. And so I think the same potential is very possible here in Sweden. And I'd like to bring up my little partner Please. in crime from Tansta, um, who Come I've been up working here. with. Faria.
Welcome. Thank yeah. you. So Faria is like the, like the Tien Stas Oprah, you know. She interviews guys, like gang members, about their feelings and all that kind of stuff. And I heard about her project. So we've been doing a lot of stuff in the community. Um, maybe you want to tell them a little bit about the Usher thing? Or? Yeah, when, yeah. Uh, when Quincy Jones uh, bring, and how do you say it? Uh, when Usher came to Tiansta, it was such a brilliant thing for us. Uh, it made us feel hope, and uh, because it's not things that happen every day. And Usher didn't go anywhere else. He doesn't even, went, he wasn't in the city, nowhere. No, no. So he was just in the neighborhood, and that means everything for us, and that gave us hope, and that showed the community that Quincy really cared about us. So, and Usher, why he came to the hood is because he's from the hood, and that's the only thing like he can relate to. Relate to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what was the impact, you think, that day? Maybe talk about what happened the night before and how this... Uh, yeah, the night before, it was a shooting, and the day after Quincy came, and no, Usher came, sorry. Uh, I talked to the, uh, the guys who shot each other and they made peace because they believe that we can give them other opportunities. Yeah. yeah. And, and Faria, Faria have, has family members that's been seriously afflicted by the gang problem. So she's doing a lot of work in the community um, trying to curve it through emotions and talking mm. about things because that's the problem. Everybody has this bravado attitude, right? Yeah. And so we want to humanize and, and dissipate that. So. Yeah. yeah, because they listen to me because I've been through it. I'm still going through it. I have, as he's told you, family members. So I know what I'm talking about. And this is really, really, really emotional for me. Yeah. Thank you for mm. doing it. Yeah. <laughs> So last thing real quick is, so we're working on a media project where we're doing exactly that. Is it's like half scripted and half documentary. Yeah. And it shows the root reasons that lead to crime yeah. and how to process them differently, mm -hmm. right? And so people tell their stories more honestly instead of what you see in the rap videos, yeah. mm -hmm. they're actually telling you what it really feels like mm -hmm. and that they actually do have fear. And, and so that, we hope, will change other people who are watching it. So. Yeah, because this is human beings. Just because they're in gangs doesn't mean that they don't have feelings or they're heartless because they're doing that because of loyalty. Yeah. It's not because of they want it or something like that, but that's how they express their feelings. And yeah. they go into this kind of problem because they lost someone they love. Yeah. So it's more than just yeah. shootings. And now we need to wrap up this part of the session. Um, so just last slide uh what what is your mission so basically right now we want to create a platform where third culture can thrive you know and, and one by one we're finding the right people to do it so you know we welcome anybody to the table who has the same mindset and and we're, we're gonna go like starting from now we're just gonna start putting these pieces in place yeah so. and we're going to thank two of you you're going to stay yes uh by also have giving you the opportunity to introduce one more person. Yes, yes, yes. Because, <laughs> you know, when we had the moment, we just wanted you to give it to... So when I was bragging about how much talent was in, in Uten in these areas, you know, I just wanted to show you an example of one of the ones that I feel is... I adore her talent-wise. Um, she's an amazing singer. She writes all her own music. And she sews her own clothes, you know what I mean? And so I, I want to introduce um, Mary and Jai. Hey, little sister, don't throw your life away. World can be dark and cold. Hear me when I say. But don't let temptations lead the way. Oh, little sister, freedom isn't clear.
clothes God knows you're beautiful in the eyes of those ready to stand by then turn their backs and go when it's the time to go home you believe that you're meant for much greater don't let no one kill that dream no girl you can fly and be whatever and then be the change oh be the change up your crown born a queen shining bright your time is now no place for shy take your spot love yourself heavenly brown so show them you know how to own it just let me be just let me be real special I'm talented I believe every single person here is special the same way everyone has a unique fingerprint I believe we all are gifted some find their gifts early in life and some find their gifts later in life but the one thing I can't stand seeing and it's when someone doesn't believe they have a gift from God and that is what I call waste of talent Hey, little sister, winter's getting close. Black isn't beautiful in the land of snow. Prince won't be charming, nor the kiss you waiting for. Unless you will change the game. Thank you. 